hey men, statistics tell us that when we send our kids away to high school and college, oftentimes we're sending them away to deny their faith. How do you equip and empower your sons and daughters to discern the truth from a lie and defend it to the death? Find out on our first of two installments of today's podcast. Men in the Arena Army, we salute you. Hey guys, thanks for listening to this episode of the Men in the Arena podcast. I'm Jim Ramos, your host and your guide of Spotify's number one podcast for Christian men, helping you to become your best version in the stress bubble of life and beyond. Welcome to today's show. Guys, as I share with you, I read like 40 to 60 books every year, and I do a lot of skimming through books uh, to get to the end of the book when you're reading one a week, but this book really slowed me down. Uh, It got my mind thinking. I've got a lot of questions in my brain right now, and you are going to love our guest today, David Richardson. Let me tell you about David. So he's been married to his beautiful wife, Pamela, for 36 years. They live in Atlanta, Georgia. David is the president of the Assumptions Institute. He served on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ over 30 years, a.k.a. crew. Dave's highly sought-after cultural and intellectual strategist using the power of assumptions to help educators, students, and parents develop real-world discernment without being argumentative. Wow, there's a first. I'm excited to hear about this. He's also the author of the groundbreaking book, Trans. Parent, how to see through the powerful assumptions that control you, which is our topic for today. And I'm excited to dive into this headlong. David, thanks so much for coming on the show. Jim, thanks so much for having me. I've really been looking forward to this. Yeah, me too, man. I when we first had you on, I realized I don't have the book and I have to have the book. And I'm so glad <laughs> I've got the book. Yeah. And it's a yeah, great that... co- great cover. Thanks. Yeah. The, I uh, just the way that that whole thing came together was uh, uh, one of those things of God. I, I, uh, I had been writing the book for five years trying to figure this thing out. Yeah. Uh, the power of assumptions and what uh, uh, what any practical good it might be, because, you know, usually the world of academia is uh, not exactly uh, relatable to most people. And uh, I, that's the world I'd been working in for such a long time. But uh, when... I wrote the book. I never had a title for it. And when I uh, settled with the the publisher and all of that, and we started working on it, uh, he uh, said, well, I need a title so that we can do a cover in the next eight days. I thought, what? <laughs> uh, and uh, and so uh, I was just asking God over and over again for the, uh, what's the title going to be? I, I, yeah. I don't know what to call this. And uh, he gave it to me uh, uh, on uh, a Monday night after the, uh, football championship, uh, the college football championship game, and at the same time, uh, sent it off to uh, the graphic designer who had not read the book, didn't know anything about it, and that's the concept she came up with, is the iceberg. And the crazy thing about it is that's exactly what's in the book. She had never even read the book. So it, there, there's so many God things that went into uh, the the writing and uh, and uh, a completing of, of this thing that uh, uh, it, it just humbling to have been a part of that project. Well, and that is really true. You know, there's we, we look at a, a person and we go, okay, this is what they believe or this is a comment they made, but there's a whole world underneath that. There's a whole world underneath that that directs uh, what's what they believe and why, and you call this assumptions. And so I want to back up one step and just have you tell us a little bit more about your, yourself so our audience can get to know you better. Oh, sure. Well, uh, even though I live uh, near Atlanta, uh, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I'm a, a Northwest Oregon kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, uh, from a little farm town in uh, uh, Northwest Oregon, just about an hour, hour and a half outside of Portland. Uh, graduated from little farm town high school, went off to uh, uh, the University of Portland uh, to not only get a college degree, but my goal, my plan was to be a fighter pilot and an astronaut. Uh, since I was five years old, and I'm one of those guys that if I decide I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that. Uh, so I wasn't in the Boy Scouts. I was in Civil Air Patrol. I learned to fly airplanes at McMinnville Airport when I was 17 years old. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, I was an alternate nominee to the Air Force Academy and uh, ended up going ROTC at the University of Portland because 
uh, uh, that was a, a better opportunity for me to get in the cockpit of an airplane. So mm-hmm. it wasn't so much I was seeking to go to uh, UP because of the school itself, but simply because it had Air Force ROTC, and I, that's the hoop I got to jump through to get into the cockpit. But as often happens when you're in college, things happen in your life. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's when I made my commitment to Christ, was my sophomore year at the University of Portland, uh, which, which was rather an odd place uh, uh, for, for something like that to happen. Yeah. And within a couple of months after I committed my life to Christ, the Lord clearly showed me that he wanted me to start a campus ministry on that campus. So, uh, and he said, contact Campus Crusade for Christ. They'll give you the help you need. It was literally that clear. Wow. Uh, so I did, and I connected with the uh, the, the, the Crusade cr- uh, staff, and we started the ministry in the fall of uh, 1981 uh, with the experiment of having the students, i.e. me, <laughs> And my friends run the ministry. The staff would disciple us, and then we would do the ministry to see if that would work. And it did. Not only that, but that same ministry still exists to this day, wow. led by students at the University of Portland. That is really, really cool. So, so you you entered campus ministry at the university level early, early on. Yes, and you worked at Campus Crusade, now known as Crew, uh, specifically targeting university professors. So yeah. from that experience, why did you Now I'm going to we talked a little bit offline. I'm a massive sure. fan of education. I'm a massive fan of knowledge. I have in recent years lost faith in higher education because of a couple of reasons. One is uh I think that their uh, education is not if it's specialized, I think it's good, but generally it's a uh, uh, students are coming out with tons of debt and not uh, able to get a job that they could have got out. They could have just got out of high school. The other thing yeah. that I'm a strong proponent against is this uh, intersectionality or this uh, agenda being taught beyond the education, which I uh, fell victim to that uh, going after my master's of divinity degree. And so I didn't fall victim. I just had to defend my faith and, and all that stuff. And so I chose to back out of uh, and not give these people my money. So you are, this is your mission field though. I mean, yes. this is your mission field. And I think you and I are probably on the same page uh, as far as this mission field goes. At what point, at what point in your ministry with these professors, did you decide, man, I need to take a different approach well, uh, it uh, first really started for me when I was finishing my uh, Master of Theology. If you could believe it, this little farm town guy who uh, grew up a truck driver's kid had an opportunity to do a Master of Theology in Applied Theology at the University of Oxford. Wow, that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, and uh, as I was doing my dissertation research, I decided on my research project was going to be studying atheist and agnostic professors. That's, <laughs> that's my ministry. That's my target audience. Oh, that's funny. So I figured uh, I better get to know my target audience unless I just want to content myself with the, the 5% of people in the university that already agree with me. Yeah. But if I actually want to help build a kingdom, I got to figure figure out how do I get to these guys? And so I did hour long interviews with a bunch of them from all different disciplines in the university. And one of the conclusions I came to is, uh, you know, asking them, why is it that you stiff arm God and really like atheism? And uh, they gave me two distinct reasons. One is that Christians are not very good uh, representatives of God in the church. You know, they're a bunch of hypocrites. Uh, uh, They just use that label, but they're really not that much different than everybody else. And and that's a legitimate critique, but we do have a message that addresses that, which, of course, is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If you're living the Christian life in the power of the Spirit, then, of course, if you're not living in the power of the flesh, you will look different. The problem is that most Christians don't. Yes. But the other thing that they uh, clearly uh, showed me, even though they didn't realize they were telling me this, the other reason that they like atheism and stiff arm God is that God is not a very good explanation for the world and how it works. In other words, how where everything came from, how everything works, when you invoke God as an explanation for things, that doesn't make any sense to them. Hmm. And yet they did tell me uh, some of the interviews that I did told me about some professors that they knew who were Christians, who had managed to bridge that gap, who had managed uh, to make that connection yeah. between their Christian faith and their academics and their research. Not just, I'm a nice guy because I'm a Christian, but 
God gives meaningful contributions to the academic enterprise because God knows everything about everything. And the Christian who can uh, bring that truth from God in the Bible and translate it into the professional setting, that makes a whole different uh, difference to these atheist professors. They want to have a conversation if you can make those connections. So I'm thinking that's the key. I've got to figure out how to help them to connect real world things to the Bible. Uh, oh. But as I uh, started doing that, I give them books, I take them to conferences. Uh, I thought, well, sure, you just give them the material. These guys are smart. They'll figure it out. And they don't. Yeah. And I thought, what in the world's going on here? After a while, I began to realize, even though these guys have got PhDs and work at world-class universities, they have got barely a Sunday school education in theology and uh, philosophy and the other things necessary to make those connections. So what do they do? The only thing that they know, what they learned in grad school. Uh, in other words, yeah, you know how to do ministry. You know how to share your faith with your students and your coworkers. But when you teach your class, you're teaching the same way as everybody else in the department. You're teaching the same way as the atheists. And if you uh, don't make any difference there, then the education system is going to remain the cesspool that it is. If the problem with the universities are the ideas that come out of it and the graduates with their heads stuffed full of those ideas, who produces the product? You do. So I don't have to fix the atheists. i got to fix the Christians. And, and if I can help them to make that connection, you can start a ball rolling that's really crazy. So so you said Oxford. Isn't that where C.S. Lewis went? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to quote C.S. Lewis. So here's my theory. When I don't know who to quote, I just quote C.S. Lewis. So I'm pretty sure he said this, but C.S. Lewis talked about something he called functional atheism. And it sounds like you're describing that with Christian college professors. Am I close? Yes, absolutely. And And if you really think about it, most of us are really in those shoes. I mean, uh, when we go to church, we go to a small group, we, uh, we're involved in some kind of Christian activity, our faith is meaningful and relatable. Mm -hmm. But when you ask somebody, what does God have to do with flying an airplane? What does God have to do with medicine? What does God have to do with running a business? Uh, if the only answer you get is, well, I'm a nicer guy, I'm more ethical, I have more, greater integrity, that's important, yes. But what you're saying is he's a coping mechanism for your personal life, but doesn't actually contribute to knowledge. He doesn't know anything about chemistry. He doesn't know anything about flying airplanes. He doesn't know anything about economics or any of those kinds of things. Uh, he only knows about personal spiritual development. Well, that's not true. Uh, but yet you don't find chemical equations in the Bible. So how do you make those connections? Yes. So I'm, I'm looking for something that is transferable that I can teach over and over and over again, and people will get it, that it's simple enough that it doesn't require a postgraduate education in the philosophy of religion <laughs> to be able to yes. get a hold of it, or years and years of apologetics training. Now, I have that, Yes, but uh, how many people are actually going to do that? Exactly. Very few. So whether it's a professor or whether uh, is a business guy or uh, you know somebody uh, uh, who's an accountant or working a, a regular job, that's how most of us live. We don't know how God relates to real world things in reality, apart from being a nice guy. Yeah, no, that's really good. Well, in your book, you said the challenge for Christian adults, aka parents and leaders is to radically change their own public lives to match their private spiritual lives. So let's, let's, when we talk about functional atheism, I love that phrase. Let's go, let's start with the parents because the parents our guys listening to this podcast, they most of these guys have children, and they're sending them to high schools, they're sending them to colleges, they're sending them to trade schools. So let's start with parents. What what do you want to say to Christian parents now who may oscillate between cr functional atheism and actual Christianity? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? What would sure. you say to these parents? How, how can you help them right now? Well... Uh, the thing that's uh, that's important is uh, you, you, most people think that you've got to get all of this uh, theological education and apologetics training and all of these things that uh, are, are it's way over most people's heads. Yeah, agree. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I'm odd. You know, I'm I'm the kind of guy that sits around and reads books like Modern Physics, Ancient Faith. <laughs> Who cares about that kind of thing? <laughs> but those ideas are powerful. Yes. And how do you connect those uh, to real world things so that 
you know, I grew up around farmers and loggers and truckers and people like that. How does it make sense for them? Yes. And that's what I was looking to do is uh, is trying to find a way to do that. And I stumbled across it. The, the thing that's really scary uh, is, you know, first of all, understanding the reality in church today, 64 percent of young adults uh, within a few years of high school graduation are going to walk away from their faith. Uh, that's been going on not just for a few years. It's been going on for a few decades. Absolutely. And and uh, and what we're doing as a, uh, as the church at large has not changed that statistic. According to the Pine Tops Foundation, it's over a million young people a year. And so when moms and dads are looking at that statistic uh, and, and they're uh, raising their own kids, of course they don't want their child to walk away from their faith. In fact, we did surveys with parents uh, and asked them, you know, because we rather than just kind of guess at where parents are coming from, we asked them. And uh, I asked them, uh, is your child a Christ follower? And 95% of them said they were. And I asked them, how important is it to you as a parent that your child remain a Christ follower into their young adult life? A hundred percent of them said it is extremely important. That is wow. numero uno, uh, mission fail if that doesn't happen. Uh, that's how uh, important it is to these parents. But then when I asked them, how confident are you that your child will remain a Christ follower into their young adult life? Only 38 percent of them express confidence. Well, now, so their expectation yeah. is way up here, but their confidence that it will actually happen is quite low. And wondering, where's that coming from? Uh, especially understanding the increasingly hostile anti-Christian culture that uh, their children are going to have to live in and lead in. What are you, what are you doing? I asked them, what are you doing specifically yes. to equip your child for that reality? It's, it, it's coming. Whether you want it or, or like it, it doesn't matter. It's coming. And what have you done? And and they said, well, you know, uh, we have them involved in the church youth group. We send them to a Christian school or we homeschool. Uh, we send them to Christian conferences. We do retreats. We have Christian media. We do home Bible studies. We have conversations around contemporary issues and the Christian faith, all those kinds of things. And I'm thinking, well, that's really good stuff. Yet your confidence is not very high. You seem to be doing all the right things. Where's the missing piece? Why is it that you don't have the confidence that these activities that all are really good and valuable should produce? And then as I was reading some other uh, surveys and uh, 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 demographics of American Christians, I stumbled across another thing, and that is that only 35 percent of people who self-identify as a born-again Christian in America believe in such a thing as absolute moral truth. Mm -hmm. Only 35%. Mm -hmm. And if they're under the age of 30, it's far fewer. It's It, it could be as low as single digits of, of young people yes. that believe in absolute truth. So what's going on is we're actually making two strategic errors <laughs> as, uh, as, as the church. The first one is that we're exposing students to truth, and that's what we're doing with all these activities, taking them to church, getting them involved in the homeschool, Christian school, Bible studies, retreats, et cetera, et cetera. It's exposing students to truth with no equipping to recognize anything is true. So if you don't know how to recognize truth in the first place, how well does exposing people to truth with no, uh, with no understanding of what true is in the first place? How's that going to work? It doesn't work very well. The The other thing is that we assume that this discernment skill, this ability to tell the difference between true and false, right and wrong, good and evil, is an innate skill that everybody has it. So if I just show you that this is good, you'll know that. Or if I show you that this is evil, you'll know that. Uh, this is true. This is not. But that's not true. The scripture is very clear about that. Ephesians, I mean, uh, uh, Hebrews 5.14 tells us that solid food is for the mature mm -hmm. who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So discernment is not an innate skill. It's something that requires practice and training. And so if we are not intentional as dads, as husbands, in training and equipping and practicing this basic discernment skill, you can expose students to truth all day long and they'll never recognize it. And in fact, isn't that the, the condition of our culture today? 
we're facing a crisis of truth uh, that we haven't really dealt with decisively. I mean, how many times do you hear people say, well, that's true for you, but not for me? Oh, yeah. Uh, the Bible's the word of God if I accept it as the word of God, mm -hmm. or the gospel's true if I accept it as true. That doesn't mean it's true on its own. It's just true if I accept it as true. How do we deal with that? So you're talking about, uh, I love your research. I love your research here because it's so powerful and I agree 100%. You talk about 35% of born again Christians believe in moral or absolute truth, which is appalling quite frankly. But then what about that Barna 9% number? It you dumb it down, you reduce it down even more with this 9% number because I mean, I've always said, David, that in my interactions with people because I'm always I'm always on the offensive, not the defensive, right? And Me I know too. you are too, right? So I'm always on the offensive and I have learned as I'm fishing for men that about 9 to 10% of people I run into are sold out all in believers. Can you talk about Barna's research and how that supports that theory? Well, uh the the crazy thing is that uh you know, George Barna is now at uh, Arizona Christian University. And uh, they have this cultural research center where they're producing a report every year now. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a long uh, interview that they they do, not just with Christians, but with all Americans. They're, they're wanting to understand the uh, long-term trends related to people's uh, spiritual attitudes, mm -hmm. their uh, uh, political attitudes, all, all of the different uh, uh, things that fall into our everyday lives, uh, and how the gospel and the word of God relate to those things. The The sad thing is last year's survey, uh, I haven't seen this year's uh, yet, it should be uh, out uh, shortly or may have just been published, but according to the survey last year, only 6% of all Americans, not just Christians, all Americans, believe uh, or have what they call a biblical worldview. Wow. So I thought it was I thought it was 9%, so 6%. 6%. So this is a so here's the disconnect, right? 100% of the parents who are Christians want their kids to uh follow Christ, but only 6% actually follow Christ. So you've got this 94% gap between what parents say and what they do. Yes. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. That's dangerous. Uh, and, 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 the, and the crazy thing, uh, you know, because I've been doing apologetics since I was 19 years old. My first job with Campus Crusade for Christ was as a researcher for Josh McDowell. Oh, how fun. <laughs> how fun. <laughs> so, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've, I've known uh, uh, McDowell's for, uh, for 40 years. We've had, uh, Sean, and, we've and, had uh, Sean on the show. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The first time I met Sean, he was six years old, riding on my knee in between meetings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've known them a, a very long time. So, and, so okay. So, uh, so, so we're so fresh out of college. I'm do I've already been doing apologetics for like three or four years. Oh, yeah. And, I, and I've done it all in my career. I've got two postgraduate degrees, uh, a seminary degree, as well as the Master of Theology from Oxford, all oriented around ap apologetics and, and applying that. My degree's in applied theology. So, the thing that was absolutely stunning to me as I was looking for the key to unlock this connecting uh, God to real world things and how I eventually stumbled on this assumptions method that I use is uh, one of the, the very disturbing conclusions I came to is that teaching Christian worldview is not the solution. It's the source of the problem. That was mind blowing to me. Say because that. Can you, you say that again? Of, say that again. Teaching worldview is the source of the problem, not the solution to the problem. That was absolutely disturbing to me when yes. I, uh, as I was doing this research, uh, and because I've taught worldview for thirty some odd years, and uh, the thing that uh, we're battling is this relativistic understanding of truth that says, "Well, uh, uh, this is how I view the world." Well. You, you view it that way. I view it this way. And in fact, uh, the whole notion that reality is perception was invented by a guy named Immanuel Kant. Yep. He's the guy that invented worldview. He says you can't know things itself. All you can know is your perception, your view. Everybody's got their own view. And it's equally valid and true for them. So that framework is what started this whole relativistic way of thinking in our modern Western world. And that's the very thing that we teach as our main apologetic mm. <laughs> uh, is we're actually using a framework 
uh, to communicate a message that claims to be true for everybody, the gospel of Jesus Christ, using a framework that says nothing is true. Wow. That's How monumental. Do you do that? That's monumental. Yeah. How do you communicate a message that claims to be true for everybody with a framework that says nothing is true? The, that truth is only determined by me, by the perceiver. So it's my perception, and my perception is equally valid to yours, uh, and so it's my truth. How do you get around that? Well, I figured out how to do it. And, and it's not focusing on worldviews, because, you know, presumably, if I'm looking through the world through a pair of glasses, I could take those glasses off and put a different pair of glasses on, mm -hmm. and then the world would be different because I'm wearing a different pair of glasses. But is that really how it works? No. If I take my glasses off, what if I don't put any glasses back on? There should be nothing there. But there is. Yeah. It may be a little blurry, but there's something there. What is that? That's that is, the world without glasses. That is the really world. so there, I, there's so much I want to say to this cuz I'm uh, I just this is really getting good. This is really getting good. Guys, hang on. You're getting ready to have a mind-blown moment. So you might want to pull over here in your car and just chill out for a second. So so you you and I missed this in your book, but you called this a discernment skill. And yes. I was so locked into this assumptions. I, I was trying to transfer it over and translate like what how do I translate this so that guys understand what I'm really talking about here, what we're talking about? Yeah. And this is a discernment skill. I, yes. I think that's the so the discernment skill is what we're going to talk about next. But we are trying to help our men in the arena have the discernment to see things that nobody else sees and then to equip their their wives and those they love to move into this this phase so that you're not falling victim or prey to this message out here, but you are on the offensive and you are one of the fishers of men that God has called you to be. So I'm going to stop there and say, okay, this discernment skill you you call. Well, let me. I'm just going to read this from your book. Yeah. You said what are these? And you're talking about the taking off the glasses. So what are these deeper? hidden concepts that separate our faith from our public life and cause spiritual demise of so many. Then you said this, they are assumptions. Every notion believed and championed by anyone is actually built on the bedrock of certain assumptions. Once assumptions become automatic, I'm on page 21 of your book, they disappear from our conscious reasoning. They are hidden. They are submerged foundations of reasoning, thus the iceberg on the cover of the book, much like understanding of an iceberg. So I'm going to unleash you to talk about assumptions. What? So let's start with defining assumption, and then we're just going to go through the assumption type. So sure. what, how do you define this thing called assumption? It's the autopilot in your brain. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> Essentially, uh, uh, you know, when, when you think of the function of an autopilot in an airplane or in a boat, uh, it's designed to uh, take over the basic function of the airplane. When I first uh, learned to fly airplanes when I was 17 years old, uh, I'm flying in a little Cessna 152 that has nothing. It's mm -hmm. totally manual. Uh, so I've got one hand on the control yoke, one on the throttle, two feet on the rudder pedals, and it's uh, uh, maintaining altitude, speed, and heading. Uh, is uh, is a constant uh, 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 jockeying of all these controls. You're constantly moving them uh, to, so that you're staying right on, on course at the right altitude at the right speed. Well, that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So if you have a device called an autopilot, you turn that on and it keeps you uh, at altitude, on heading, and at the right speed. So then the pilot can uh, work on uh, higher executive functions, checking the flight plan, talking to the crew, talking to the tower, going to, get, uh, going to the restroom, getting a cup of coffee, whatever it happens to be. So you're not having to think about keeping it straight, level, and on course. Uh, and our assumptions do the same thing. We're not focusing constantly on, is this real? Is this real? Is this real? Because when we talk about truth, uh, how do we know something is true? Mm -hmm. uh, when I, uh, I'm looking at Jim and I say, isn't that a beautiful green shirt that Jim's wearing? And <laughs> you look and say, what? Jim's not wearing a green shirt. Uh, of course he's not wearing a green shirt. Because what I said about the actual shirt that Jim is wearing didn't match. Yes. So therefore, what I said about your shirt is false because true things 
the measure for true is real. True things match real things is the yes. thing, the way that I describe it. True things match real things, and it's real things that are true. And there are things that exist in this world that are not real. And if you cannot tell the difference between that, you cannot tell the difference between true and false. So, like, for instance, uh, uh, I do this uh, uh, with students a lot of times. I'll put up a picture of a beautiful pink Pegasus unicorn on the screen, and I'll say, does this exist? And they all say, oh, no, no, that doesn't exist. And I said, yes, it does. Huh? What do you mean it exists? You're looking at it. Yeah. It's an image. Yeah. You see it as an image on the screen. It's right there. Uh, it exists in the mind of the artist who drew it. it. It exists in movies and in stories. But can you go out into the woods, catch one, and go for a ride? No. Why? Because it's not real. Hey, don't tell Scott that. That's their national animal. Did you know that? Yes. The unicorn is a Scottish <laughs> unicorn. That explains a lot of their history. <laughs> so, so, and I, I'm, I'm partially Scottish, but I want to read this because what you're saying is beautiful. And I want to read right out of your book. Cause I think this just just adds an exclamation mark. It's icing on the cake. You said, quote, assumption, a thing that is accepted as true or as certain to happen without proof. An assumption yep. is a starting point for reasoning about our world, our lives, and ourselves. They operate unexamined in the background of our minds like an autopilot. So I just think that the way you put that, and I like this without proof, there's a faith to being an atheist, right? There's a faith yes. to being an agnostic. Yes. So this is really yeah. good. So let's talk. So how do these assumptions work? Like you said in your book, you said, I found that I could use use it to uncover the assumptions behind almost anything I read, watch, or hear in as little as 20 seconds. So how does this work in, in real time? Well, uh, uh, I have this thing that I've developed. It's called the critical assumptions test. Cat scan. And, uh, uh, yeah, it, uh, so yeah, a cat. You, see, you, give it, you get every, everything, a, a cat scan, whether you're watching a TV show or a movie or yeah. a news program, yeah. listening to music, listening to a podcast. Uh, or reading an article or a book or uh, a web page, uh, I'm I'm always giving it a, a CAT scan. Yes. Uh, I'm looking for the underlying assumptions. And the reason I do that is because if the assumptions that the argument is built on, that the story is built on, that the message is built on, if those assumptions are true, then probably what I'm being told is true. It's a good initial truth test, and I can do it in a matter of seconds. But if the assumptions are false, even if I don't understand the sophisticated argument, the complex ideology, anything built on false assumptions has to be false. And so likewise, I can get to what is false very, very quickly. And uh, when I'm focusing on the assumptions, uh, uh, you know, it, if you have a conversation with a five-year-old or a seven-year-old for any length of time, you've experienced this. Uh, why is that? Well, why? Well, it's because of this. Well, then why is that? Well, it's because of that. But why is that? Well, you can only go backwards four, five, six, seven questions before you you reach a wall. Uh, you you reach the limit of what you know and what you don't know. And because you're not all knowing, because you'd be God by definition if you were, <laughs> uh, we're limited yeah. humans. We have a limit to what we know and what we don't know. And when we reach that limit to try and understand and explain something, we have to assume something to be real and therefore true, that we don't know. Because if we knew it, we wouldn't have to assume it. But all of us eventually reach that limit. Uh, and, and so we start with an assumption about the nature of everything, the nature of reality, what's really real. And that assumption is the thing that you don't question. If you question that, it blows everything up. You can't make sense of anything. It gives your brain the blue screen of death. <laughs> uh, uh, you can't make uh, sense of everything. And and you've had conversations with people where uh, you're very reasonable and rational and all of that, but they're emotionally resisting. Yes. They don't want to. They don't want to go there because what you're doing is you're getting close to that core assumption. Shaking the bedrock. That, shaking the bedrock. You're shaking the bedrock. And and that core assumption is the thing you can't question. Because if you do, that's the point of conversion. Mm. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so you can't question that. Uh, and it's the thing that you cannot prove, and it's probably not even provable. Like, for instance, uh, one of the uh, common ways of assuming is uh, understanding that the nature of everything is it's just all physical stuff. It's just matter and energy. There's no minds. There's no spirits. There's no God, angels, demons, none of that kind of stuff. That's all fantasy. That's all Easter bunnies, leprechauns, and tooth fairies. Yes. You've met people like that. Yes. And uh, and so really the nature of everything is just physical stuff. 
Uh, random interactions of matter and energy produce complex organization and complex organisms. That's all there is. Well, if that's true, isn't it possible that something non-physical exists beyond the scope of your knowledge? Unless, of course, you're all-knowing, which would make you God by definition, but you're not. Which would, which so would it, put you out of the type 1 area, and you'd be in type yeah. 3 now. <laughs> yeah. Or type so, 2. Yeah. Uh, the, my, my, yeah, my assumption types. Yeah. So, the, the, uh, so in fact, it's possible that something non-physical exists beyond the scope of your knowledge. And the only way you could verify that that is not the case is if you had access to all places at all times, which you don't, which would also make you God by definition. So exactly. you're assuming there's nothing non-physical out there. And, uh, and, and, and so, uh, Let's just recognize it for what it is. It's an assumption that you don't question, you don't prove. And how do you make an assumption? Well, even at the On highest, faith. well, even At faith. the even at the highest levels of the our academia, you can take that. So this is your type one profile. Type yep. one profile is only nature and nature only. So you can walk the highest level professor all the way back to as far as they can walk, and the best they can do now is go. There was a big bang. So the moment yep. they do that. You're going, okay, you've just crossed a threshold of faith that is beyond my faith as a type three assume, sure. assumer, right? So, yeah. and I think the key thing here that I, I really like about what you're doing, David, is I walk into a room, I'm like a fisherman, right? I'm looking at the water going, do I see fish rising? <clears throat> do I, what's the weather? I'm looking at everything around me and I'm saying, okay, this is the perfect lure to throw. So if I walk into my coffee shop, I'm looking at the barista. What does her name ta tag have? Does it have a rainbow? Does it have a cross somewhere? Does she have any kind of button? Is she wearing a shirt? So I'm instantly drawing into all my surroundings. Okay, this is probably a type one person. So mm -hmm. therefore, so now I'm automatically on the offensive and not the defensive. So now I know something that she doesn't know. I know something about her worldview or her assumptions. Sorry yeah. about that phrase, worldview. And now <laughs> I can right. enter, I can lean into. Uh, a conversation, I can begin to throw the lure, so to speak, right? I mean, is this what we're talking about? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's kind of like having uh, uh, the intelligence briefing before you go into battle. Abs well, that's the see. <laughs> okay, so this is the key ingredient with our parents, right? We have to equip our kids for battle. We, you know, and they have to, and I think going into it, sitting in on their psychology 101 class and training our 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 18 year olds, our 19 year olds, when you walk into that class, you need to identify what this person, what their type is or what, what they are assuming about, I would say what they believe, but their assumption. And so type one, for example, you said type one assumers, what real, what it really boils down to is just one thing for them. There is only one reality, the natural material world. The universe that is a physical only reality is what's real for type one assumers. It's the only thing that exists. So everything we talk about is physical by necessity. So this, this really helps us as a college freshman, as a parent to say, okay, this, now I know something about you that you may not know about me. Yep. And uh, the interesting thing, too, is because there's these three different ways that every person on the planet assumes about reality, okay, what's good. really real. Those assumptions are, first of all, assumptions. They can't be, they're not questioned, they can't be proved, and they're accepted on faith. Yes. Everybody does it, they just do it differently. There is no such thing as a person not of faith. Uh, so when we as I love Christians that you describe said that. ourselves as, uh, uh, as people of faith, we'll say, uh, as if that's something unique. <laughs> Everybody's a person of faith, just people of different faiths. And in fact, when you read down uh, uh, the, the column of the cri critical assumptions test, like, for instance, the type one assumer, uh, what's really real is the natural material world. It's just uh, natural things. Where did it come from? Uh, uh, nature made nature. Uh, how does it run? Uh, nature runs it with natural laws. Uh, where is it going? It's going towards annihilation and death. A human being is nothing more than a highly evolved animal who uh, 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 constructs knowledge for themselves. The thing that's good is whatever I decide it is. And the problem with the world is religious people who believe in these supernatural things that aren't real. <laughs> So you that just went it, down. You just went down the eight critical. You just went down the eight core questions of determining the reality, right? Yes. So, yes. which is in and your that, books. That what that is is a statement of faith. 
Well, so this is, I love it when I had a guy tell me one time, I'm an atheist. I said, what's an atheist? He said, oh, I don't believe in God. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Yes, you do. He said, no, I don't. I go, you said, I don't believe in God. And in your statement, you use the word God. How could you say, state uh, your unbelief in something yet name it at the same time? So you do indeed believe in God. You just choose to reject him. You know, and yeah. so, but it's having the mentality that everybody has faith, which I love that you say that because a, a type one person, a nature is the only reality person would say, absolutely not. I don't believe that. All I believe is in fact, fact comes in the form <laughs> of science, right? But in yeah. that there's a lie, right? There's an assumption that they can't prove. Yes. Everybody is standing uh, on a basic assumption about what's really real that they don't question, can't prove, and accept on faith. Everybody does it. They just do it differently. And what that also means is that every government program and agency, every uh, business, uh, every institution, including every school, every teacher in every classroom every day teaches theology. It's just not Christian theology. It's based on one of these other two faith systems, one of these other two sets of assumptions that uh, are all codified there in the, the critical assumptions test, and it's really easy to get at them. Well, and this is the danger, or this is the danger, I think, when we look at academia. I've been a pretty, pretty strong antagonist towards this intersectionality movement mm -hmm. because it is, an, it is a uh, type one movement that it's a type two movement. It's a type. It's, oh, uh, well, I think it, it's uh, it's idealism. It, there's, it's not even real. So that's interesting <laughs> no, because real. I would say it's it, at least early on. I th I would say it was a type one because there I saying, oh, we're just believing in truth here, and the, well, this is interesting. Because well, I don't want to go into this headlong because yeah, no, it gets no, off on a rabbit trail, but but uh, this is really. In Let's move into type two. Let's sure. move into type two. So you said, so type two profile. These are people who assume that mental. And spiritual is all that there is. So yeah, can that's you the thing that's real. That's the thing that's important. So the spirit. So and, then, and you list you, in your book. You list Buddhists, Baha'is, Hindus, Shintos, Taoists. All the you know you you Christian Science, Scientology, Mormonism, Tribal Analysts, Native American religion, polytheists, Islam. So, but you just said intersectionality. That 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 is also in the type two category. Yes. Tell me why. Uh, well, it's because it's not so much oriented around a spiritual ideal, because the thing that uh, is the hallmark of a type two way of assuming, whether it's of the mental variety or the spiritual variety, is that it's focused on some kind of ideal, whether it's oh, a spiritual ideal gotcha. or whether it's a sociopolitical ideal. Okay, so okay, <clears throat> now you got me tracking. I, you got me lost a little bit, but you're right. It's this ideal. This I'm just thinking of intersectionality right now. That's really the thing that's really in revival in our country right now. Well, yes, I think Jesus, it's humanism. There's a revival of Jesus right now too, but but we're seeing this and so trying to put a finger on it and that finger is that's a type 2 assumption. This is mm -hmm. the high ideal where oh, that's really good, man. I think this is really this is helping me. <laughs> <laughs> so so you said this, I'm just going to read out of your book cuz I think it's really sure. powerful. You said only one thing is really real. You use that phrase a lot. What's well, really real? Only one thing is really real. Both types agree. However, beyond this, the two part ways, the type 2 assumers uh the the type 2 assumers, the one single reality is not a physical reality. It is the opposite. The sum of everything that truly exists is a non-physical ideal. There it is, ideal. Yep, it's a non-physical ideal. So, you know, like what, one of the interesting uh, phenomenon that uh, uh, I've, I've had many people ask me about is that why is it that it seems like the radical progressives are always in league with the radical Muslims? The, the, you, know, you got these radical religious people and you got these radical atheist humanists uh, and, but yet they always seem to be on the same team with each other. Why is that? Huh. Well, it's because they're the same kind of assumer. Huh. They assume the same way about reality. See, for the for the Muslim, uh, uh, the ideal is the caliphate. Uh, uh, everybody uh, submitted to Allah, living uh, in the uh, society together, and that's when peace and harmony and uh, uh, and paradise will occur. Is when everybody is uh, is living in harmony that way. You don't even have to be a true believer. You just have to be submitted. Uh -huh. And the thing that that, uh, that uh, gets you to conform to that ideal is Sharia law. That's the purpose of Sharia, is to conform you and to keep you conformed to the ideal, because that's the way you're supposed to do things. Wow. Uh, but the interesting thing is, progressives operate the same way. 
they're focused on a humanist ideal, a socio-political ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, that they, the, the, oh, sure, we see the flaws and faults in humans, but we can fix that. And so with our enlightened guidance, because we see the big picture, and we, if we all work together, we can build a better world. Uh, that's the way that it's sold. Uh, and what, uh, what what's the, the thing that, that conforms you? Political correctness. Mm -hmm. uh, it's wow. it's secular Sharia. Uh, and, and, and it's wow. just as dogmatic. It's just as uh, uh, intolerant as uh, the, the religious variety is. That's and it's designed <laughs> to conform you to the sociopolitical ideal and to keep you conformed to the sociopolitical ideal. But what if ideals are not real? What That's, if they're just a figment of the imagination? What if they yeah. can never be achieved? I, I love what you're saying, that they're just as intolerant. It's just as intolerant. We move into a type two assumer. They're just as intolerant, although it may be masked. Yes. Yeah, because wow. you, the, the thing is, if ideals are real, if, if, if they're really there, and, and they can be achieved, then they must be achieved. Everybody must conform to the ideal in order to achieve it. Did you hear what I said? Otherwise, Everybody. You're, or you're canceled, right? Or you're canceled. Yes. Which is See, why, so it, this is, it, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. It requires 100% participation. Yes. And and, and so uh, uh, the way that that's done, first, of course, you know, we'll try to persuade people to conform to the ideal, the political ideal or the, uh, the social ideal or the religious ideal. And you do that through education and the media. Those are two indis uh, uh, indispensable institutions for that. Uh, and so you're persuading people to voluntarily conform. But what if they won't voluntarily conform? Well, if you won't do it voluntarily, we have to make you. Yes. And so there are two institutions for doing that, government and the courts. And why is it that there are so many type two assumers in government and the courts and in education and the media? Well, that's where all the progressives are, precisely for that reason. And if you will not voluntarily and you cannot be made, then what's left? You have to be marginalized or eliminated, either virtually, that's cancel culture, or if we can get away with it, actually, physically eliminate you. Because if you won't conform, you're holding up everybody else. How many times in the last few years did you hear people say, well, just go get the uh, vaccine because yeah, so, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. holding up everybody else so we can get back to normal? Yes. You know? Back well, this to the is ideal. So, so here, you said this about type two assumers. You said essentially they make their own reality. After, yeah. uh, after a similarity in core assumption, the type two assumption trail soon leads in a very different direction from other types. What do you mean by a very different location? Well, because uh, uh, the analogy that I use in the book is the Lewis and Clark expedition. I love that. I read Undaunted Courage, and I just love the story. Uh, I just, I just, I just, it was so good that you did that. That was good. Very well yeah. played. <laughs> and and then and perf perf uh, perfectly uh, 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 works uh, for the analogy that I need for the book. Yes, uh, with the three types, because there was a place in uh, uh, late July of 1805 when the uh, Lewis and Clark team uh, was uh, following their way up the Missouri River, seeking their way west. Mm -hmm. They knew they were at about the right latitude uh, with the mouth of the Columbia River. But how do you get there? And uh, they've been uh, pulling against the current for uh, for weeks uh, through these narrow canyons in uh, in central and western M uh, Montana. When all of a sudden it opens up into a wide open plain, and the river immediately forks into three forks. They're facing south, and the, and the Missouri River splits into three forks. And well, we we can see that there's snow on those mountains over there, the bitter roots, and we got to get over those things because uh, that's west. Uh, before uh, winter sets in, but which one of these roads do we take? Which one of these rivers do we take? We can't afford to make a mistake. And so they sent out scouting parties to check them out and eventually figured out it's the one on the far right, the, uh, the Jefferson River. Uh, the interesting thing is that you could take any one of those rivers. Uh, they're equally choosable. Yes. You, uh, you, you can uh, follow any one you want, but only one of them leads west. Uh, and so you want to take the one that's going to take you to the Oregon Territory, not back out into the mountains somewhere. Uh, so when I say it takes you to a unique and indifferent path, each one of those ways of assuming the type one, the type two and the type three are mutually exclusive. So if everything's just physical, then non-physical things are off the table. So type two and type three are excluded. If you say that everything is just non-physical, either spiritual or mental, you know, sociopolitical, then the people that think that physical things are important and real 
that's type one and type three. Those are off the table. And a type three assumer who believes that there's a creator and a creation, there's two distinct realities that are not the same thing. You can tell them apart. Yeah. Uh, a creator and a creation. If there's two realities, well, they can't be just one. So uh, each one excludes the others. Uh, and and two of them cannot be true at the same time. So what that means is that only one of them can be true, which is really cool. It gets that gets me around the relativistic framework of oh, it's my truth. Well, yeah. you, you can believe whatever you want, but you can't say it's true. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's really simple logic, right? It comes down to it; they cancel each other out. You have one option here. So let's move. So we've got the type one assumers are uh, only thing really that is real is physical. Yeah. We have the type two assumers that say the only thing that is really real is spiritual or ideological. And the yes. type three profile is this uh, hybrid that says God and creation are real. Uh, so so who would fall into that category and what can you explain that category in better detail? Sure. Yeah. The, the only people that fall into that category are Christians and Orthodox Jews. Uh, they basically believe that there is a real creator who's distinctly different from the creation. You can tell him apart. God is not the universe. The universe is not God. They're two things, yeah. not one thing. In fact, that's the very first truth taught in the entire Bible. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God, made. God created. Yep, exactly. And a lot of people will say, in the beginning, God. You know, it's the one God. You know, monotheism. is it? No, 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 no. In the beginning, God created. Yes. There's two things Oh, and these so two things good. are not the same thing. You can tell them apart. And in this created reality is both physical and non-physical things. They're all equally real. But the thing they have in common is that they're all created by a self-existent, non-created creator. Uh, and, and so if that's reality, that means that everything in the created world comes from and uh, uh, comes from the creator. So. Uh, when we talk about truth, well, God is truth. Yes. And, and so we understand what true is because that's who God is. God is love. Love doesn't come from us. It comes from him because we're made in God's image. What's an image? It's a reflection of something. We're designed to reflect him and his character, his person. And when we do that, we are loving. We are doing good because God is good. There's no goodness in me. It's not because I'm inherently an evil person. It's just simply uh, I'm not the source of good. Wow. He's the source of good. If there's two realities, then one's the source, the other is not. But if there's only one reality, then everything has to come from that one reality. So and, that really uh, is what distinguishes a type three from a type one and type two. Type yes. three affirm both the physical and spiritual realities as their core assumptions, but it's one plus two equals three. Hey, David, this is some real powerful stuff, and we're up against our time frame here. It, it, can we re-record this later and do a part oh, absolutely. two? absolutely. Man, I would love to do that. I would love to do that. So in the meantime, in between this week and next week, how can our guys get a hold of your book, pick up your resources? Well, uh, the uh, best way you can get to uh, what we're doing is uh, www.assumptionsinstitute.org. You can also look for us uh, on Facebook at Assumptions Institute. Uh, you can email me at info at assumptionsinstitute.org. Uh, and uh, you learn more about uh, the transparent book as well as uh, the learn to discern courses that we're in the process of building. So tell us about the app. Well, the app is uh, uh, something that's on uh, Google Play and also on the iOS uh, app store uh, that you can download. It's a companion to the book, but also what it does is it helps you to uh, begin practicing this basic discernment skill. So with a, a little bit of training on how to use it, uh, then uh, you can use this. It's, it's sort of like training wheels for your brain. You know, when you first learn to ride a bicycle and you put training wheels on a bike, it's simply so a young rider can learn to keep their balance and keep the pedals moving so that uh, they can navigate the bike. But after a while, you really don't need them. You just take uh, the, them off and uh, a young guy or a young lady can ride down the road with, uh, uh, with confidence. This does the same thing. It just trains your brain to think in a particular way. And after a while, you won't even need the app. Uh, you'll just do it uh, automatically. Uh, so that that that's what it's for. It's for practice. Well, and I, you can get that. Uh, just look for Assumptions Institute on uh, either of the app stores and you can download it. It's the one with the iceberg. Okay, perfect. Manuel, I sure appreciate our time together today. I look forward to getting you back on the show next week. Absolutely. Thanks. All right. Have a great day, man.
Hey guys, our man laws are supplied mostly by you. And when we use your man law, we'd love to send you some swag just to say thank you guys. If you want these man laws in their entirety, hit us up at manarena.org. There you can find man laws, 100 ways to get your man card revoked and rules to live by. It's a free download for you. So head on over there and grab that. Man law 16 is this. Never hug a non-related dude or a dude that is not in the middle of grief for more than three seconds. In other words, it's okay to hug your buddy if he's in grief, if he's in mourning. It's okay to hold one of your children. All that stuff's good. But if it's some bro that you see off the streets or you meet some guy, three seconds is max, man. I love you. I'm out. All right? You're out of there. So the life rule to live by, guys, is this. It's okay to show physical affection to your sons and your bros. Hey guys, if you've loved today's episode, make and you are not yet a follower of this podcast, you have not subscribed yet, please hit the follow or subscribe button on your platform. That helps us climb the charts and it helps us to impact more men for Christ and help them become their best version. Until next time, feel the wet sand on the arena floor. Hear the deafening roar of the crowd. Taste the sweetness of victory. Smell the stench of battle. Get in the game, get dirty, grind it out, and be a man.